Welcome back to the last episode of this Friday before Election Day here in the city of Calgary and across Alberta. This is the Crossboard Interview Podcast, and my name is Christopher Brown, and today we are joined by Calgary Board of Education, School Board Trustee, candidate for Ward 8 and 9. I've said this numerous times, they really need to shorten that title, but David Barrett is in with us this, uh, this afternoon. David, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me. So David, uh, if you listen to the show before, you know the first question out of my mouth is, where's your sense of duty to serve come from? Um, it's, it's something that's been instilled in me since, you know, as I'm sure everyone says, since I, I was a kid, my parents, you know, were very active volunteers, uh, had the privilege of being active volunteers, it's instilled at me at a very early age. And, and since I've been able to, I've been volunteering in, in a huge uh, number of different capacities, whether it's from search and rescue organizations, whether it's, you know, community associations, uh, environmental nonprofits, uh, all that stuff. It's, um, it's something that I've always, it's how I filled my time, you know, I, it's uh, how I keep myself uh, sharp and, and really engaged and, and feeling like I'm giving back to the community. So that's, uh, th this really isn't for those that know me, this really isn't all that shocking of a next step, I guess. So let's talk about that next step uh, earlier this year and on Monday, people will be heading to the poll actually earlier this month and on Monday, people will be <laughs> heading to the polls and voting for you because you've put your name forward for school board trustee for Ward 8 and 9. What was that decision based on? Yeah, it's, it's, um, there's, there's a number of factors. There's kind of, you know, three core things. Um, and first and foremost, I'll, I'll disclose, I have a toddler that is, is uh, two years old. <laughs> He will be entering into the, the CVE system very soon. Um, so you know what? Th there's absolutely a bit of selfishness involved from that perspective. Um, but but it's it's more than that, really, because I, I am I am running to really advocate for all students uh, in the public system uh, across Calgary and specifically in Ward eight, wards eight and nine. So so I very strongly believe that a, you know a properly funded public education system uh, is really important. Uh, it's, no, it's crucial, it's critical to, to creating a welcoming, inclusive and educated critical thinking society. Um, something that's you know perhaps uh, recently come to the forefront that we do need perhaps a little bit more of those critical thinking skills and uh, a strong education system, if, if I may be so bold. Um, so it, I'm really stepping forward. I, I, ha I have the the track record and the experience uh, of strong leadership and outspoken advocacy, and I, I view the the school trustee role really as bo both an arbiter of of the system and making sure that our, our programs are functioning, but also advocating for our students uh, as strongly as possible. So, um, I, I believe that I have the skills really to to do that effectively. Um, and I do very strongly believe that we need equitable access to public education, right? So everybody, regardless of socioeconomic status or geography, uh, should have access to a very a quality education system. So I, I'm I'm very passionate about that, and I uh, that's that's why I'm stepping up. That's why I'm putting my name forward. Uh, you know what? Uh, as everyone says, if if, uh, if you're not willing to to step up and put your name out, then you know exactly <laughs> uh you know what the follow-up question to the year's last statement is going to be and that follow-up question is has it not already has it not has the cba cbe not done a good job on the things that you've just mentioned social econ economic classes uh with uh curriculum how has the uh, cbe failed and why why are you the best person to change that why are you the best person because people are looking at the school board trustees i hope people are looking at the school board trustees because it is another election we need to vote on but why why put their trust in you because uh they might think completely opposite from you and why do you think the way you think uh yeah so that, that's a, a long a little bit of a long <laughs> question i guess but um I, I, I first you know to preface it I, I i think there's a lot of fantastic things that are being done by the, the staff and and the administration uh, as, as well as some of the uh, some of the, the the past board members of the CBE, so I, I do want to preface it with that. There is there is some good work that's being done. You know, an example where where I think it's fallen down, and, and this is perhaps the easy low hanging fruit, but the the renaming uh, of uh, of Riverside School 
the, the fact that that took, you know, four years, the better part of four years to, to establish because we were, we were stuck on dialing in a specific policy rather than addressing, uh, you know, addressing the naming uh, of a school that was, was um, making people feel very unwelcome and, and uncomfortable as well as, as, as counteracting our, our, our uh, efforts towards truth and reconciliation. You know, that that's an example of where we're slow moving. I I would also I would I would be again I commend some of the steps that have been taken by taken by the CBE recently as far as, as COVID you know masking and vaccinations, um and the requirements, but again we're 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 so slow to react. We we are the second largest school board uh, in Canada, it, right? It, it's it's one of these things where we really need to be more proactive we need to be using that voice and that weight uh to, to create a better learning environment for our students and I, I i feel that the board has often been reactionary as opposed to a, a proactive um and and again this is this is where i think i can hopefully push some of this to change i've got experience with with board governance and i i i know how to work with others uh and, and work together but also to push forward as opposed to reacting when an issue comes up now you uh I, I shouldn't say you but i i enjoy looking at websites i enjoy reading platforms i enjoy diving into policy because i think i think that is the one thing that we miss in municipal politics is policy people seem to vote for people because their name or they know each other policy yep. is where is that <sighs> on your website you have the five pillars Five pillars, and I'm going to read them off for those who haven't gone to db4cbe.ca, which for anyone who's listening or in, uh, w- uh, watching this, in the show notes, click on it if you want to learn more. Uh, the five pillars are advocating for proper funding, long-term sustainability, responsive, anti-racism and reconciliation, and expert-created curriculum. Uh, now, there's a few things I want to unpack here. So Absolutely. this is why this is why I'm, I'm hoping that you like to talk and it seems like you do. So that's great. I want to start with the curriculum. Let, let's start with the curriculum because I think that's the, the big elephant in this room that a lot of people don't really realize the school boards have, have the right to say, no, we're not going to pilot this program that this provincial government has put forward. For those who don't know, the provincial government introduced a pilot curriculum and it was panned by I think all but like a handful of school boards the school board uh the Calgary Board of Education rejected it said they will not pilot it would you have voted for the same would you have voted to reject it as well absolutely I would have voted to reject it's it's a a uh, sorry uh, I'll let you ask another question if there's a follow-up nope. rather than there is a follow-up the follow-up far. is what's wrong with it why do you think it's wrong why do you think it was bad <laughs> Well, you said we want we want to keep this to thirty minutes, right? So, uh, well, however I'll, I'll long you want to talk, if you want to go four hours, let's go four hours, David. <laughs> no, no, no. You know what? I'll I'll be brief. The, the core of it really is that this was a curriculum that was not created using experts in the field. We we didn't have experts on, on pedagogy, curriculum design. We didn't have teachers as, as experts providing uh, input and feedback or direction on this. It, it is fundamentally flawed in, in the. Uh, the pace that it introduces topics, uh, and and where that that flow, how they tie together, um, it's also severely lacking with uh, with regards to appropriate Indigenous uh, knowledge and, and history education. Uh, it it it's nobody, including parents, felt properly engaged. They they had a a, <laughs> a well to to be blunt, a, a racist help uh, a. a, a, a uh, residential school uh, denier, if, if that is can be called a thing, help pen uh, part of of the the curriculum. It, it, it's just it, it is fundamentally flawed. It's ideologically driven, and it it left out the experts that needed to be in the room and that development. And um, I, I don't know it, that no, that's but- really like it, it's flawed. It, it is fundamentally flawed. So the follow-up to that is, uh, you should know this, you're running for this position. The province mandates the curriculum. While we can all, dis- while we can all agree that this, the curriculum that they proposed was universally panned and it is a bad curriculum, 
if tomorrow morning, the day after, on Tuesday morning, if they wake up and they say, okay, we're going to implement it because we've had great response from the handful of uh, school systems that have actually piloted this program, the, the Calgary Board of Education will have to implement it. Does that make your job harder to do if you are against a curriculum that you will have to then impose into the school system? It, it both makes it harder, but also further motivates. You know, um, again, the, the, the advocacy side from the CBE, the largest school district uh, in the province, we, we have weight there. Um, and the provincial government should be responsive uh, and willing to hear feedback. If they decide they want to implement it on Tuesday, um, you, you can, uh, I wouldn't doubt whether I, whether I am successful or not, but I will be pushing very strongly against that. I will be trying to advocate for them to pause, take it back, um, you, you know, rewrite rewrite where appropriate which is which is most of it or or dig up perhaps the other the draft that was in the initial stages back in in 2018 i believe it was um i it's motivating in some ways because it is so fundamentally flawed and if it's just being pushed by ideology which which is what is in the, the content of the curriculum um that that just cannot stand and we i would be very outspoken you know regardless of my role come tuesday uh against that i want to talk about another pillar here for a second because i want to try and get to as many as possibly can in our time together uh advocating for proper funding um uh, i i would ask this question to anyone who talks about funding but what is wrong with the funding model that is currently in place with the cbe yeah, absolutely. So, so the last few, well, it was a few years ago, they, they switched the funding funding model to effectively be a bit more of a, a rolling average as opposed to you know specific enrollment tied. Um, and I, I'm I'm also going to preface this and say the gov previous government sustained the funding per capita, um, but didn't make the investments perhaps that were required. Uh, but but what has effectively happened in the last couple of years is it's an effective cut. So, so the, the province has decided that they want to say, well, it's the same amount of money, but ignoring the fact that, that the CBE is growing year over year. So, so per capita, we're actually seeing less money for students, less money for classrooms uh, and learning environments than we, than, than we were seeing historically. It, the CBE was already, you know, running a pretty tight ship, fairly lean. Uh, um, and, and, you know, with, relatively large class size, we, we were already running at operational maximum, if you will. Um, and, and these these cuts have just pushed it even further into the red zone um, where it's it's impacting, it is directly impacting the teachers that I talk to, the facilities workers that I talk to, they're, they're saying it's fundamentally impacting their ability to, 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 to teach and to create a, a, a good learning environment. So, so Sorry, one one last comment in there. Um, you know, it's 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 something that we we need to perhaps go back to the drawing board, identify what that exact funding model can be and how it can be responsive to the to the growth that we're seeing. You know, in, in Calgary specifically, and and wards eight and nine uh, are seeing demographic shifts. They're seeing more people coming back into the inner city. We're seeing a lot of younger families. Um, and how do we respond to that? How how does the province help uh, provide that? funding appropriately and in a, in a matter that can be predictable. And I, I think that's also a key thing is we need to have that stability going forward, right? Um, it, it's, we need to have a sustainable long-term model in place that ideally wouldn't be uh, swinging back and forth based on the provincial government in power. <laughs> now I'm going to put my devil's advocate hat on here because uh, I got to ask the question that the one person who is probably yelling at their screen right now saying, you have to follow up with this question we are in tough times right now, though. Uh, sustainability, proper funding is great. And I think everyone agrees that we need to properly fund our schools. But COVID-19, the collapse in the oil and gas prices in Alberta has caused a roller coaster of funding. And we are no longer able to forecast five years out because COVID-19, people are struggling and they don't have the money to pay their taxes. People, uh, The oil and gas industry is being decimated. How do we get the proper funding when the provincial government is in a position where they're going, 
we, we don't know if we're going to have enough money next year. So we're going to have to potentially just stick to what we have, or we're going to have to find those cost cutting measures to find savings in all uh, sectors, even education. Yeah. And, and I, I'm not sure that you have to steal a, a, a line from Jason Kenny recently. I, I, I almost reject the premise of your question. You know, I, I hate that I, I have to, I'm stealing <laughs> a line from, from Kenny, but um, no, I, I totally understand the, the the economy has been absolutely thrashed. We've we've had people fall on very hard times, loss of jobs, um, and it, it's been so sad. It's directly impacted a lot of students as well. Um, you know, it's uh, I, I'm I really feel for folks there. What, what we have to do is we have to put on our our hat, our forward looking hat, and say what's going to drive us out of this slump. Right? What's going to drive us out of this downturn in the economy? How are we going to move forward in a meaningful way? And the answer to that is we're going to create an educated population. We're going to invest properly in our public school system. We're going to invest in our post-secondary. And I, I won't go into that. That's a whole different ballgame. <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's, my, that's my day job right now. Um, but that's where we have to make the case that our education system is critical to helping us diversify the economy, to, to helping us create the leaders of tomorrow that are going to get us out of these issues. This, you know, this roller coaster that we, we we've tied ourselves to so closely with uh, with our oil and gas economy. Um, and again, at the end of the day, I, I I would add that our our government is in a better position to shoulder debt. It's it's not like a household I, that that. That comparison to to the government operating like a household budget is, is fundamentally flawed. In, in times like this, this is where our the, the province has the ability to shoulder debt and to properly fund things, so that in the future uh, we're not in the same position. It, it's helping us grow out of it. Uh, um, so I, again, that's why I re reject the premise of your question, perhaps. Um, you were the very necessarily... first candidate in my two and a half months of these interviews to reject the premise of my question. I applaud you, sir. I applaud you. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to go back to a word that you talked about when you were talking about the Riverside School, being responsive. Uh, yeah. Being responsive in the needs of our communities and not being reactive, reacting to things after they come up. We, we have a lot of things that are going to be thrown at us over the next few years, the next few months. And I'm just talking about COVID-19 here because that is the biggest topic that a lot of parents are struggling with right now. Are my kids safe? Are they going to be healthy? Am I going to have to take time off their school day? How can this Calgary board, how, how can they, how can the Calgary Board of Education and you as the next school board trustee for Ward 8 and 9 help parents respond to the changing atmosphere that is COVID-19? It looks like our numbers are going down for the fourth wave. I, I don't want to like jinx it by saying that out loud, but I just did. So now I'm going to probably get hate mail. And if you do send it to my email, I'll file it away where I, I properly file things. But how can we be responsive in an ever-changing health pandemic that we are in right now? Yeah. So one of the, the core pillars that we'll probably get to a little later, which ties into this though, is evidence and data-based decision-making. So, so we really need to be looking at the best available data, uh, making decisions and being transparent with parents. We, we, we can't, we don't have a crystal ball. Nobody's looking, you know, to Christmas. Um, <laughs> again, I don't want to get hate mail. Uh, nobody's looking to Christmas trying to figure out if, if, if we're going to be able to do it in person or doing another Zoom Christmas. Um, what we can do is we can implement the, the, uh, the best practices that have been determined at this time. And, you know, rapidly adopt those and, and try to provide uh, a safe learning environment. So again, where the, the province likes to sometimes um, take control and say that the school boards should be doing more. And then in other instances, they like to say, well, no, that's an overreach of your, your jurisdiction. Um, th this is an opportunity for, for the boards in COVID, their responses have been, you know, it's been at the board level that the province has effectively said, you go for it. You're on your own a little bit um, with, with a few exceptions more recently, like the reinstating of uh, contact tracing and things like that, or the planned reinstatement, sorry, of, of contact <laughs> tracing. Um, so, so 
again, hopefully I answered that question, but, but really trying to be transparent, right? And, and using the data that we have, the best available data we have um, to make those decisions. So I, I, love being, I love being transparent and I love people who can say transparent because this follow-up question hits right to that word. You will be elected to represent a large part of the population. You will be representing Ward 8 and 9. You will be representing people who do not vote for you. Let's be honest, there are a lot of candidates in Ward 8 and 9 who are running, and unless by some fluke they all go in and all their all the candidates go in and vote for David Barrett, you are not going to get 100% of the vote. How do you represent everyone and everyone's wants, needs, and opinions? Because being transparent with people, talking to people is great, but how do you do that? How do you do that? Because people, like, let's take the mask mandate, for example. There are parents out there who do not agree with the mask mandate. The Calgary Board of Education in August introduced one that said this year they would have one in the school system. People were pissed. That's, I'm, I'm saying that lightly here. But how do you represent those people, but also represent the needs for fact-based evidence in our school system? Yeah, so, so one of the things that I like to say is I'm, I, I really plan to be responsive. I am generally quite responsive, uh, you know, to, to inquiries. Every, I think everybody uh, that's, that's emailed me on the campaign so far has received responses, even if they were very uh, obviously, um, you know, probably not going to vote for me based on my response. I, I do like to provide my thought process, my, uh, not just my thought process, but the evidence that I'm using to, to arrive at at an outcome. At the end of the day, you're right. We're 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 not. No one will get a hundred percent mandate. Um, that's that's democracy. But what we have to do is we have to make the best decisions that we can for the 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 broadest population within our our uh, school. So so with the mask mandate, the the data shows. <laughs> the data is there, and unfortunately, you know, I, I'm again maybe I'll get more hate mail after this, but. Um, that's that's what it shows that that's what the data shows i i can completely i will listen to people that uh that that oppose it however at the end of the day the the data and the the evidence is supporting the implementation of of a mask mandate and and other covid precautions to to minimize the risk to our students our, our especially particularly our unvaccinated students you know there's, there's so many that cannot be vaccinated and they're at risk um the, the fact that we can do something to help mitigate that um, based on the best available evidence at the moment, um, we need to be doing that. Uh, and again, I will never be able to, I, I can't make a promise to, to try to represent 100% of the people. I will do my best to listen. I will do my best to learn uh, and to be open to those discuss to, to any discussions. Um, but at the same time, there's always going to be somebody that's that's uh, not happy with the decision that you make, um, and I, I I won't I won't pander to to a small percentage a small vocal percentage, um, you know, but in the case listen. of the mask mandates. I, I yeah. you know what you can you can tell me your opinion. I will I will definitely review it and I will consider and and provide you my responses and and again the evidence or the data that I'm using to make my informed decision. So that that piggybacks onto this the follow up to that is. You were there to represent the people of Ward 8 and 9. Uh, sometimes the majority of people in 8 and 9 might come to you and say, we want this. We want, I'm not sure what the, this X issue is going to be wanted. But in your heart, you don't want it. You were there to represent your, uh, your constituents. So how do you balance what you want with what your constituents want? Do you, do you vote for the constituents or do you vote for what you believe in? Well, again, I, I think it's a discussion, so I'm going to give a non-answer. Um, <laughs> you, you know, that's sorry. That <laughs> uh, it's a bit of a non-answer. Um, there's a discussion that happens there. Then you know, I'm I'm open to hearing why and, and what people are what thought process people are using to arrive at uh, you know the need for decision X, for example, right? Uh, and um, that's where I am open to education. I'm open to changing. I'm open to discussion. Um, and 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 again, that discussion is two ways. I, I will share my my opinion. I will share my uh, the the how I arrived at my my stance. Uh, but again, being open and ready to to adjust that based on on feedback and data that is provided for from folks. Um, 
I think that's really important. Um, and I appreciate yeah. that. And I appreciate your honesty. And I appreciate you not rejecting the premise of the question again, because I would have felt <laughs> insulted that two times during an interview. I went, whoa. I want to turn for a second because we've talked about your you, 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 but let's talk about eight and nine. You've talked to the parents of Ward eight and nine. I'm assuming you over the last few months, over the last since you've announced your candidacy, you have been talking to the parents of eight ward eight and nine. You have your five pillars. Are the issues that the people of Ward 8 and 9 are bringing to you about the CBE matching up with the five pillars that you have outlined on your website? Absolutely. Um, this was, so, so I didn't launch until uh, a little late in the game, but I, even before that, I had been having lots of discussions with teachers, with students, with parents um, in the wards, you know, just to, to kind of, to figure out if I could be the best advocate uh, for them. So, so a lot of people, especially through through COVID, have been advocating for stronger evidence uh, and database. And I, I hate using those buzzwords, but you know, I my background, I'm as I'm a scientist. I am used to working with data, and interpreting the data, and I, I've got a lot of experience applying that, um, you know, and, and uh, reporting it in such a way that it can be used to to inform policy. Um, so, so particularly with COVID, that that fits in with with um, with that pillar. The, the long-term viability and sustainability, absolutely. Um, you know, particularly in eight and nine, we, we've got a lot of developed, well, they're all developed communities with, with the exception of some that are growing at the edge of Ward 9 on the, the east end, obviously. Um, we've got a lot of established areas. We've got a lot of, of uh, inner city communities. And unfortunately, um, you know, like, like we've seen with Russ, Russ Carrick School, uh, it, it's been closed. And this is perhaps due to a, a disconnect between city planning and the school board planning uh, with regards to, to enrollment. So, so there's a lot of people that really want to make sure that their community school is the school that everybody wants to send their kid to. You know, the one down the street from me should be the one that is providing a, a great education that is, you know, uh, uh, that is paralleled across the city and across Ward 8 and 9 because we need equitable, equitable access. Um, but they want to see that it's going to be sustainable long term. We, we, we don't want to have to switch to busing kids, you know, three communities over because we, we haven't done our planning and we haven't got sufficient children in the neighborhood. Um, so so that, that ties in with that, uh, that issue as well. Um, you know, Anti-racism and truth and reconciliation is absolutely critical. We, we've seen this over the last, particularly the last few years. We've, as as white settlers, we've we've been abdicating our duty to, to discuss this, um, you know, more broadly. Uh, I, I've talked with a lot of folks that are in, you know, underrepresented communities, and they they feel the the, the school board in many ways is a a systemic and uh, systemically racist institution or discriminatory institution, right? It's a colonial set up it, it doesn't value uh, uh indigenous knowledge or or perspectives it doesn't it, it the way that we've set it up it, there's often discrimination against uh, visible minorities that occurs um it, it's absolutely something that the the residents of ward eight and nine have, have brought forward as an issue um again core pillar um the the long-term sustainable funding model i think we already touched on that um you know People understand that teachers are being at, asked to do more and more and more with with less effectively, um, and and that is affecting the students' learning. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. And then responsiveness. I, I think there is a desire for, particularly in this election. I, I I'm really pleased that the the school board trustee position seems to have gotten a lot more traction this year. Perhaps due in part to uh, the curriculum draft and, and a few other things. But I I, I think responsiveness is critical we we need people in these positions that are that are um you know uh, I, not, and not to, to insinuate that anybody was but I, I think we need more than just warm bodies we need people that are really engaged and tied in uh, and really actively uh responsive to to students and teachers and parents uh, and any other stakeholders so so uh, sorry that was a really long answer perhaps but it, this is these are the issues that i've been hearing from which, from parents which, uh... and stakeholders yeah, I, I'm never going to interrupt anyone. I'm just making sure I take notes. That way I can uh, ensure that I ask the follow up questions that I need to. But I'm just keep, I'm just cautious of time here right now as well. And before we move into the, the closing and the wrap up here, I, I have one last question. 
on October 18th, you will, if, if you are the successful candidate in Ward 8 and 9, you will have to engage a community that is very COVID shy right now. Let's put it that way. How do you do that? How will you ensure to the people of Ward 8 and 9 that you aren't going to be that warm body that is going to go away and not be seen until the next election? Because I've talked to residents around the city and I hear the same thing. I've never heard of my school board trustee. I didn't know that one existed until this election. How do you ensure that that doesn't happen? How will you engage with the community, but also be part of the community that people will know who you are? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question, right? It's it's really easy for us to sit here and say, well, I'm going to be more engaged than other folks. <laughs> um, you know, there's a, a few ways that I can do this. And, and folks that know me uh, know that I am, I'm not quiet. Um, you know, I am very principled. I, uh, I, I don't shrink away when there's, you know, in the sunlight, if there's, uh, if, if something's being shot on, on me or, or uh, an organization that I'm volunteering with, I'm, I'm very passionate about, you know, being there and communicating. So, so I'm, I'm uh, always open. I'm always open to discussions uh, with residents. I, I would like to see some uh, scheduled engagement with the parent councils. Uh, so whether it's quarterly, whether it's uh, you know every every six months, or there, there's a lot of schools. I, I acknowledge that. So so being conscious of of well everyone's time and the volunteer time particularly, um, but having those regular check ins. But at the same time, I, I want people to feel comfortable reaching out and saying here's the issue that we're seeing how how can you as our trustee help us to rectify it or, or what other resources can we use to to help address it right um so you know short of of just being very open I, i'm very available via social media in person you know phone call like everything like that i i'm i i again i am very outspoken i'm very uh, willing to engage and um, i'm easy to get a hold of let's put it that way so it's it's uh, i i and I enjoy that. I, I think that's an extremely valuable discussion to have. And um, I, I, I really passionately don't do not believe that I would be a warm body. I, I think that I, I've got the skills and the experience, and I, I know how it is to, to be reaching out and, and not getting a response. And, you know, you know, and that's incredibly frustrating. And as I said earlier in the discussion, even if I, I don't necessarily agree with your stance, I will 100% engage and discuss with you. Um, you know, to have that as long as it's a meaningful and respectful discussion. Uh, I appreciate. I, I that. hope that answers that question. <laughs> it does. It does. Um, I want to. I want to talk about the future now because on October nineteenth, you let's put our hat on and say that on October eighteenth you are elected the next school board trustee for Ward Eight and Nine. On October nineteenth, you wake up with that new title of trustee elect until you are sworn in. What's your first priority on October 19th? Oh, that's that's a very loaded one. Uh, probably, first of all, collecting collecting uh, campaign signs. Because <laughs> I don't want to be the person that has the trash out there for the next, you know. No, uh, j jokes aside, um, getting getting in and meeting and discuss discussing further with administration, um, you know, really particularly building that bridge with the folks that are doing the day-to-day -day operation of the CBE is really critical. Uh, and again, prioritizing, um, as I've said all, all through it, I, I think prioritizing the safety of our students, so for COVID, and so making sure that we have the proper uh, the, the, the proper precautions and steps in place to make sure our students are safe and don't have to go back to online learning, if at all possible, because that, that's very inequitable. Um, and, and then, again, starting, starting to work uh with with folks in the community really trying to identify what the core you know based on these core pillars um how we can start addressing some of these things so so working uh with communities to try to break down these systemic uh systemic barriers and the equitable access uh part is really key for me as well so so making sure reviewing the programs that we're offering making sure that they're available um, you know where there's demand, and, and making sure that there's there's not those barriers to access um, based on on funds. That, that again, again, identifying perhaps the data that's available to help inform those decisions. 
Now, as a businessman, my uh, as a businessman, I I have to put metrics into place to ensure that I'm successful. I need to get this done by this date. I need to get this done by this date. Now, I ask this question to all candidates, so that way, if you are the successful candidate on election day, I can follow up with you in 100 days, and I can say, have you got these accomplished? What metrics are you going to put in place for your first 100 days? So let's put this out to February 2022, that in February 22, 2022, you can go back to the people of Ward 8 and 9 and say, I have started work on this file. I have accomplished this. I have done this for you. So that way... They know that you are doing what they've asked you to do. And then that way, I, as the host of the show, can come back to you and say, have you got them accomplished? So what metrics are you going to put in place to ensure that you are successful, but also ensure that you are doing what you have promised the people of Ward 8 and 9 that you're going to do? That's a really, really tough question. Um, you know, not not being on the inside, obviously, it, it, not knowing what particularly, and I keep going back to this, not knowing what data we have available uh, on specific areas, right? So so I know we've got a very active, uh, the, the CBE has the CBE CARES initiative, um, the, the group that was meeting to to try to address, again, systemic racism within, within the education system. Um, and I think that's one of the key things that we really need to do is we really, uh, we need, I, I would like to review that. They haven't made the reports public that they've seen. And um, I, I think reviewing that uh, and identifying concrete actions as a result of that, uh, you know, we, we can't dismiss the work that other people have done that that folks have contributed. Um, so so again, perhaps the 100 days, I think, is perhaps a little bit of an arbitrary number, but um, go, going back and I think identifying, you know, what precautions have we put in place to keep your kids safe? How have we gone to uh, the province to try to address some of these core issues? Um, you know, here's how we've uh, how we've made the province aware of our stance on um, the curriculum. Th these kind of things. I, I think there's there's some metrics there as far as um, formal stances taken by the CVE, uh, as well as um, again, <laughs> I'm a data person. I, I really enjoy diving into that. I, I need to see what's there, what we're working with. Um, as far as that goes. And I, I think the other metric that would be really useful is, is identifying the connections within other levels of government, um, particularly the city of Calgary, um, and see, seeing where, you know, how we can make access to and from our school safer. So, so really kind of uh, the measurable part of that is, have we reconvened the, the teams that are meeting on that? Have we started that discussion back up? Have we pushed forward um, you know, the safety and infrastructure component uh, in, again, in within a hundred days. Sure. That's, you know, three months, that's enough time to, to, to start that ball rolling. Three, three months is, um, it, it is a short time. So, so there, there's not a lot of perhaps concrete actions that you'll see in three months. I think particularly when you think of the first month, we'll be getting up to speed on things. So, Hey, uh, I, I don't want to reject first, the first person. You, you're not rejecting the question, but you are the first person to say 100, month, 100 days is a short period of time. But politicians, and you've heard this statement from every politician from every level of government say, the first 100 days, we're going to accomplish this. Well, how are you going to accomplish that? What what metrics yeah. are you putting in place to accomplish what you've set out? So I appreciate your and it's often it's often unrealistic and, and we know that we've, we've seen that. Right. And again, that perhaps speaks to being more uh, politically driven. We don't need politics driving this discussion. Um, we need evidence and we need data driving the discussion. And, and if, if we don't have time to, to look through that, if we don't have time to identify what we don't know, then, then we shouldn't be making rash decisions. We shouldn't be, I, I can't promise the world in a hundred days. Let's put it that way. That's true. Um, but in order to get to October 19th, in order to get to your first 100 days, you need to get elected on October 18th. I want you to talk to the people of Ward 8 and 9 who are listening to this and who are watching this. Why should they put their trust in you on October 18th to vote for you as their next school board trustee for Ward 8 and 9? Go ahead whenever you're ready. Absolutely. Uh, I really appreciate the time to, to, to put this out there. Um, I, I've, I've got experience within the higher education system. So the post-secondary education system, including uh, uh, pedagogy design, course design. Um, I've got a lot of experience with 
board governance, which is critical. Um, you know, being able to work with team with within a team or a, a board, which is a you know a team that works together. Um, I, I've got that experience. I, I am a proven community advocate. I've been able to to ex to, to extract to to acquire funds and infrastructure for communities. Um, you know, and I've I've got the experience working within and for government uh, institutions. Um, I know how they work. <laughs> I am deeply passionate about our public education system. I believe it needs to be both equitable and remain crucially remain public and, and not be watered down by private offerings. I'm, I'm very hard on my stance on that. Uh, and as I've said probably so many times, and everyone's going to roll their eyes at this, we need to use the data to drive our decision making. If we don't have the data or the evidence required to make informed decisions, we need to acquire it, right? If, if we're talking about, um, again, long-term, or, or let's just say sustainability of schools, we need to have the numbers there to, to back up our decisions. We, we need to be able to uh, to really lean on the science and the the, the, the data that is available to, to drive our decision making. I, I'm a scientist by training. I bring a different perspective. I'm not a politician. I'll, I'll freely admit that. Um, I know some other folks in the in the running have identified themselves as such. I, I I don't think what we need is another politician sitting at the CBE table. I think we need diverse perspectives. We need somebody, not necessarily with a, a kid in the system, but somebody that is going to be a passionate champion for the system. Um, we we don't need gatekeeping of of who can and cannot be or should or should not be on, on the CBE board uh, of trustees. Um, I, I, I feel that I have the experience, the knowledge and the ability to engage with all of our communities uh, meaningfully um, and, and champion our public education system and really provide the case for proper funding and, and a sustainable, uh, you know, a sustainable education system, because it's, it's critical. As I said, right at the opening, it's critical. We're at a time when we need to be raising critical thinkers. We need to be raising people that can stand up a, a, and make those tough decisions in the future. It's, it's not you or I that are probably going to fix the majority of the problems that are out there, Chris. I, it's, it's the next generation, to be honest. We need to give them every single possible tool to be effective at, at affecting change. And I, I, that's I'm very passionate about it. I, I hope that comes across, and I, uh, um, I, I think there's there's hopefully many reasons to vote for me. But if nothing else, I I really believe in our our public education system and keeping it public. Now, for those who are watching this and listening to this, there is those people, like I said earlier on, uh, who are yelling at their car stereo are yelling at their iPhones or iPads or computer screens on YouTube watching this saying, why didn't you ask him this question? Why didn't you go into this detail? So for those who want some more information about you, David, how can they get involved? How can they reach out and ask the question? Because I think a lot of people will not be making up their mind until they walk into that ballot box on a ballot booth on Monday. So how can people ask the, the last minute questions? Yeah, well, and I'd, I'd also like to acknowledge that we've we've uh, had highest advanced poll turning out uh, ever by a landslide. Um, so, so maybe a few people already have made their decisions, but the, to those that haven't, um, they, they can reach me via my uh, website is, is db4cbe.ca. And I think you said you'd put it in the show notes. Um, on all my social media channels, I, I'm db in YYC. Uh, I'm extremely responsive to that. If you want to fire me an email, that's uh, David at db for cbeca um, You know, sh sh short of that, just just give me a shout on, on some uh, on some medium, and uh, you know, we, we can touch base further. I'm happy to meet safely, COVID safely, and you know, at one of the schools outside or anything like that. I, I'm very open to uh, meeting with folks. So, yeah, David, I, I want to thank you so much for this. Um, to my listeners and to my viewers, you know the routine. David's Facebook, Twitter, email, website, show notes, check them out. I highly recommend them. <coughs> Pardon my French. And and Chris, if I may, I, I realized at the beginning I didn't do any, I didn't do an acknowledgement of of the land. I didn't acknowledge that we're on Treaty 7. We're settlers, you know, here here in Mokinstis. Um, I 
I am remiss for for um, not mentioning that earlier. So I I just wanted to toss that in there. Sorry for for interjecting. No, hey, it's your interview as much as mine. So you you have the right to interject as much as you want here. I want to also say this. This is our very last interview with a candidate for this election season. I want to thank all candidates who have taken time out of their campaigns to uh, do these interviews, but I also want to thank you, David, and uh, be honored because in this episode, as it airs, we'll, we will have done more episodes in this season alone than our first two seasons. This campaign has taken a toll on myself, but I've been honored to sit down with people like yourself, David, who are running in this election. So thank you so much for doing this, David. And and Chris, thank you to you for, for, for putting the time and effort into this and helping raise the profile of you know, both the municipal uh, election and candidates, as well as the, the trustee candidates, which often get overlooked, to be honest. So I, I really do appreciate the fact that you're you're helping to raise the profile and, and uh, it, it, appreciate it, you know, and, and, and also appreciate the, the other candidates that have, that have sat down and chatted with you as well. I think that we're, we're all better for these meaningful and, and good discussions, right? So. Yeah. Um as and I'm going to say this to the people who should hear this and should do what I'm about to say, but vote on Monday. Take half hour, forty five minutes, depending on where you live, depending on poll lineups, and vote. This election is the most important election that we will be facing, and this is said all the time, every election, but this is the most important election that you will be facing this year, because this is the election that you're voting in. So it is the future of our city, it's the future of our school board, it's the future of the Senate, it's the future of fluoride, it's the future of X, Y, and oh, daylight savings time. So get engaged and vote. Do not complain on social media for the next four years that you didn't vote and your voice isn't being heard because if you do not vote, you do not have a voice. So vote, 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 vote. Take some time this weekend, learn about all the candidates if you haven't already voted and vote for the person that is going to best represent you, your morals and your values at the board, at the table. David, once again, I wanna thank you so much for doing this. We will be back tomorrow morning at eight o'clock with two incumbent retiring councillors for Calgary Council. So, uh, David, thank you. Thank you for doing this. <laughs> Thanks to you as well, Chris. Cheers.